You're listening to FTO Podcast on the FTO Network. Listen and enjoy. All right. How's it going, guys? This is D here at FTO Nerd Talk. We're doing an interview with uh, Brian of, sorry about my dog there, with Brian of Mountaineer West Production Comics. How's it going, Brian? Oh, pretty good. How are you? I'm not too bad. So, um, check out this comic book. Check out the, like, all the stuff from your, from your titles here. The angel really step, really, uh, sticks out. The angels, uh, I think you have two yeah. different titles of it. War angels and war angels. Yeah, right now we've, yes. Yeah. We've got one full graphic novel, uh, war angels, which is kind of, you get to see the, the universe through the eyes of effectively kind of a new recruit. Right. And then, um, the origins is five separate origin stories and we're actually starting to work on the second graphic novel uh right now you have a lot of issues when it comes to this comic like uh i think it was at least was it six six issues all together yeah we've got uh basically five that we came came out after the first issue we were lucky enough to get the funding to go straight to the graphic novel um and then uh also we had enough to support the origins so we've got um, five different origin stories. We've got five chapters in the first graphic novel. I did a 1.5, which is kind of another, like a one-off story with one of the characters that I really like. Um, okay. And so, yeah, we try to, as soon as we get enough money, we try to put another comic out. Now you keep saying, wait, who is, who is we exactly? Who's all part of the team? So, so I am the primary owner, uh, the writer and creator for all the comics that we put out. Also, I write science fiction and thriller um, novels. And also, um, we have a short film based off a script that I'd written uh, that's available um, on YouTube as well. Um, And I say we because I've got some uh, financial backers that kind of believed in what I was doing early on and kind of helped me get the ball rolling. So they're pretty much silent partners. Um, and then they, I pretty much run the show. So. And that, that film you're talking about is Lions, right? That's the short film you're talking about? Yep. And uh, you can see a blurb of it from our website. It's just uh, mountaineerwest.com. Uh, it's a full 15 minute SAG um, backed um, sci fi short. It's actually based on a relationship between two sisters, and one of them happens to be a super soldier. Um, and uh, we're going to run a Kickstarter for that and the, and the novel that goes along with it uh, sometime this year. And then one of the perks for that will be uh, you'll get the um, full 15-minute um, video with that as well. See, like, that, that's cool that like the protagonists are the, the two star characters of all female because I know that's a theme with a lot of your other comic books also. With Angels, you have uh, two characters. One's a new recruit, like you said before, and the other one's a, a veteran. And like they're pretty much taking on these these opponents inside of War Angels and inside of the Book of Luca. I haven't read the Book of Jessica, but I'm pretty sure uh, I think it has two female leads in that story. Also, you have a lot of stories with strong female leads inside. Was that intentional or that just happenstance? Um, I think that just kind of um, happens as I write. Um, the The Book of Luca, the main character is male. His name's Luca, but his uh, love interest, so to speak, is a pretty, not even pretty, a really strong female character as well. Or the Rangers, um, and that just right? becomes, it's kind of, uh, Rangers, yeah. Um, and uh, in general, I think it comes from my time in the military, the last uh, probably, I don't know, eight to ten years before I retired, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to work with a lot of uh, female sailors and female officers and uh, saw them in a lot of leadership roles, showing a lot of strength. Um, and so I think it just kind of creeps into the into the writing. Um, and I think it's just fun to write. And hopefully I do the, the female characters justice. I know it's tough as a male writer to, you know, write uh, the female story. So hopefully um, I get it close to right. I was going to say something about that. Like you actually captured like the tones that they have very well. They don't seem monotone. They don't seem boxed in. They have a lot of compassion and sympathy for each other when it comes to like the female characters. And they know how to, they, in the book of Luca, they know how to give it back and forth with the men also. They know how to, to, to assert their power, assert their dominance, while, but also being feminine at the same time. You captured the voice, in my opinion, pretty well. 
Thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah. You have a lot of titles here, like from Counter Surfing, which sounds hilarious, by the way, and uh, A Fabulous Apocalypse, along with The War Angels and The Book of Jessica and The Book of Zeke. And I think you, did you redo The Book of Luca also? Did I get like a reprint? Yeah, so the, there's a single issue of the Book of Luca out there, which effectively is the first chapter of the graphic novel, the Book of Luca. Okay. So it's it's that it's just had a different cover um, than when we moved on to the full graphic novel. Yeah, right. uh, Couch Surfing. You mentioned that one. That's we actually currently have a that's the one we have a Kickstarter going on for right now. I think it's about 150 bucks or so from from being funded, but that follows um, a group of homeless teenagers who also happen to be an exorcist and a witch and a werewolf, and they're trying to find the exorcist sister who's gone missing under supernatural uh, kind of uh, uh, leanings. And uh, so it shows them kind of trying to deal with being these homeless teenagers and fighting supernatural evil at the same time. So. Are, are all these universes connected or are they all separate universes for these stories? Uh, so if um, there's separate ones, anything with War Angels kind of falls in that War Angels universe. and I kind of, I was thinking a little heavy metal magazine when I was trying to create that universe because effectively uh, war angels are these women that have died through acts of bravery or heroism that have the opportunity to become these warriors that fight across these different realms uh, kind of against the forces of evil. And so it allows me to write like uh, one chapter, one storyline that is science fiction, one that's fantasy, one that's set in a modern world. Um, like the first graphic novel starts in modern day, you know, in America and Los, in Angeles, Los Angeles, yeah, uh, ends up in a magical world of Haven and ends back uh, with a uh, shootout in a bar in LA. So, and um, I gotta say, like, I read this, I read this entire graphic novel, and it's seamless. And there's, there's a lot of dialogue with the character, but that dialogue is it's not overtaken to the character. It doesn't overflow in the story. You really get like a good feel for the characters and their mission. On top of it like you 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 seamlessly put those things together very well thanks i appreciate that i think uh i started off writing novels so it's always a struggle with me it's like i i don't want to throw too much stuff in a page there's some people who do that and it works well for them but i really want to try to have the art tell most of the story um i try to look at it before i even put the words in there and see if you can just follow it with with no words uh, and if you can do that i think i've kind of set it up the right way the, the, splash, the splash paces like were really well done. Uh, I'm not sure who the art was on War Angels, the volume one, but the splash pages, like when you get like those big fight scenes inside of it or like the, the scene where they went to the club for the first time, the artist really sold those panels so well. Yeah, that's uh, Tony Doya. He's done a little bit of the book of Jessica as well. And he's gonna be the artist for the second graphic novel. And then the colors for that is DC Alonzo who actually did just get uh, a gig with uh, Heavy Metal Magazine as well. Oh, wow. So you really are getting some, getting some elements from that magazine and put them into your comics. Yeah, the, uh, and then in terms of other universes, anything that says Book of, that's it's what I call the Third Testament universe. Um, and so it's basically a supernatural, post-apocalyptic kind of world, and it just follows different characters. So in Luca, he's uh, called a guardian, uh, and that's one type of kind of, a uh, superhuman person that was given powers by angels. A uh, book of Jessica is follows uh, Jessica, who is a um, LGBT uh, uh, person of color as well. Um, and uh, she is called a relic holder. So she has kind of next level powers. She's actually wears one of the nails that was used uh, during the crucifixion. And it gives her these high level powers, but it's also kind of a burden. So she has nightmares and all these other things. Uh, the book of Zeke follows a character who just gave up on being one of these guardians and he's kind of just roaming the wasteland because uh, he's kind of lost his faith in what's left of humanity. So that's well, kind of his story arc. Um, and then um, right now we're going to come out with a Kickstarter in a, probably the next month or so for the middle ground. Um, and it's a, basically a prequel to the book of uh, universe. And it looks at uh, colonization uh, of America and it shows that while Native Americans and Europeans, particularly uh, the English, were fighting for control of the land, uh, there's also a supernatural battle going on between the Native American uh, spirits and then the Judeo-Christian demons as well. 
is that is that your main goal with these, these book of titles like just to, to blend some religious aspect and some history aspects and to teach your readers like about things that happened in the past or are you just are you just going along as as you write um so i actually the middle ground i'd kind of started as its own separate thing and then i thought for a while that it would make a really really good lead in to this world uh in the book of luca which is called the, the third testament universe um and uh, it's the big thing about luca is um he's seen the apocalypse he's seen angels he's seen demons but he's never seen god so he still doesn't believe in god hmm. um, and he was this um before the apocalypse he worked at a comic book store uh and dick's burgers in seattle and now he's kind of this superhero and his partner's an ex-marine uh so just that little bit of a dynamic uh, i think is interesting too i keep looking at the covers of these titles especially like the count the couch surfing and uh middle ground and it reminds me of um the 90s era of image comics like dark child and the 10th and the series like that did you uh did you have any inspiration from like the 90s comics or the 80s comic books when you decided to make these yeah a, a little um like i said the, the thing that struck kind of still strikes me the most is some of the imagery from he heavy metal magazine i'm not quite as um you know abstract is that in a lot of cases but um i try to go after really good cover artists uh as well so for couch surfing the cover artist for that is um uh oh what was it? his name <laughs> uh, I, won't, I won't tell if you don't <laughs> justin Hunt, that's it and um he actually did a lady death cover recently that explains um, a lot then uh the book of luca and more angels uh and uh, Fabulous Apocalypse, um, which is my kind of standalone uh, satirical take on an apocalypse. Um, the cover artists for those are um, Kevin McCoy, right? Done most of the line art. Uh, he's, he does a lot of Zine Scope stuff, and he also did the Seahawks logo. Um, and then David Ocampo has done Heavy Metal Magazine. He's done a Marvel cover, and he does primarily the uh, colors, but he's done a couple of the individual covers as well. I really got to ask this question. Like, uh, it's okay if you don't, if you can't answer it, but uh, how do you find these these artists? How do you get a hold of these guys and like have them um, have them do these covers for you? In, in terms, so of most of them I found through like the convention circuit, which is you know <laughs> non-existent right now. But, right now, yeah. Um, just uh, running into them, seeing their stuff, um, the um, you know talking to them about the stories. I'm actually working on something. I'm not gonna can't talk too much about it because it's in early development with uh, Bobby Breed. Uh, as well, uh, we're put, we've got a story for a full graphic novel uh, that we're going to kind of we're kind of slow rolling it just because uh, we're not really doing getting any planning on doing any major funding for it in the short term just because the other projects we got going. But um, yeah, mostly just meeting those uh, guys at um, conventions. There's also a great um, a great platform on Facebook is called Connecting Comic Book Writers and Artists. It could be artists and writers. I don't remember which one comes first. Okay. There's like 20,000 or so people on that page. And you just go on and say, I've got this project. This is how much I want to pay um, and what kind of style you want. And then artists just, you know, post their uh, portfolios on there and then you can pick from there. Oh, I found goodness. some really good artists through that. Sounds pretty like, like cut and dry. Like right there. What was this called again? Uh, it's, uh, the page is called Connecting Comic Book Artists and Writers, I think. All right. Um, that that kind of put that in a search thing, and that'll get you close. But and you can get any, I mean, there's some uh, full-time professional artists that post stuff in there. Um, actually, uh, the, the color for the second cover for Couch Surfing, Omi Rimalante, um, who did some interior colors for me, did uh, colors for that one. He's done Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Black Panther, Vampirella, uh, some of that stuff as well. So um, I found him on that page. This is on Facebook, right? Yep. Gotcha. I found a group. It is called Connecting Comic Book Writers and Artists. So if anyone out there want to look into it, I guess I'm already a part of it. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, not a lot of people inside of it, but uh, the work that you have, and if you found it there, my goodness, that's a place. That place is definitely a gym for new artists. Um, I think uh, I was going to ask you about this is a little bit segue from talking about your material. Uh, the creator of Black, um, Kwanzaa Osajifo, 
he's uh, donating a hundred percent of his uh, his funds, his sales to the Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, and I saw a lot of other creators doing that also. Like, what do you what do you think of that? I'm not asking like if you're going to do it yourself, but what do you think about creators donating their money to protesters doing like during this time? No, I mean I think it's great. I think um, supporting organizations like like that and other you know. Um, whether it be, you know, private organizations or just any kind of uh, social uh, organization, I think it's good for a, a company to be um, involved in, in that group. And particularly when you talk about like the comic book and the con community, um, for the most part, um, there's a lot of really kind of open-minded uh, people in those groups. Absolutely. Um, and, and so it's, it, it just makes sense. Uh, we're, you know, I will tell you like kind of where we're at right now. We're, um, we're in the funding comics right now. We, we actually, we've, uh, we spent about, uh, I think 60,000 bucks this year. And I think we've made about 10. My, my <laughs> so, goodness. But, uh, part of that is actually, honestly, our model we've got, we, like I said, we had some, had some backers who are really, uh, that really liked kind of the ideas, the things that I was working on. I can see why. So we knew we were going to do that this year. We knew we were going to spend a lot of money. Um, and because we want to have a lot of titles out there, um, a lot of different things uh, with, with quality art, and quality stories. And um, we were looking to kind of for this year to be our big uh, con year, <laughs> which obviously got put on hold until next year. Did but, you guys get to go to Emerald City Kong? Was that was that still on the list? I thought it was on your page that you had to set up yeah, for that, Emerald City. Yeah, that one ended up. It's uh, postponed until uh, I believe uh, August. All right. And so right now it's still scheduled to occur then, so we'll be there um, at that. Um, and then a few like Rose City was canceled until next year. We plan on going to Houston, and that got canceled. Um, some smaller ones were canceled. Um, but in the whole scheme of things, like there's a little bit of a drag on the business, but, um, you know, like in terms of like personal finances and stuff, it's not, I can't, I'm not going to complain about, uh, any of that stuff. And there's some right. people there that, that, you know, me not getting to make an extra comic book this year <laughs> doesn't really affect my quality of life. So. Well, that's a good way to look at it. Nice, nice optimism. I appreciate that. Uh, a lot of your characters, this is probably going to be my last question for you also. Like, you know, I usually have better questions than this, but uh, your stuff is just so polished, man. You just like a, like everything like I talked to you about before, you just blew out of the, out of the water for me. Um, a lot of your characters are very military-based. A lot of them use guns, a lot of them have like a, a lot of weapons inside of it. You said you served also, and you know a lot of people who have. Is that what you're trying to bring to this universe, to all these universes? Uh, so it kind of depends. I think uh, with the Book of Luca and War Angels, there's definitely that element, if not direct military stuff, but you get, um, I, I draw on some of that uh, uh, for kind of some of the things that the characters do. Um, the uh, A lot of it in my actual, my novels are, a lot of those are like space opera, military science fiction. So those are really heavy into that. Um, side of the house but like couch surfing you won't see a lot of that stuff in there I really kind of want to stick to like it's kind of Magic these space, kids right? in this kind of alt world and they're homeless and they got these powers so and then um, Fabius Apocalypse is just my complete it's just um, kind of a satirical look at just this the mockery of fears that people have uh, when it comes to um, someone that's different than them so when what what about Zeke? What about that character? Does he have like a lot of military, like a, I guess mannerisms to him, or he just kind of like a a, a wandering guardian? Yeah, I would say a little more uh, kind of Mad Max kind of thing. Okay. Uh, with him, and he was one of these guardians that you would have seen in the Book of Luca, but he was They're on the very East strong, East. right? Yeah, yeah, and um, so they're trained in weapons. Uh, they they actually have kind of superhuman strength. They heal really fast um but he left all of that basically um the person who was leading the group that he was with was his father um and, and was very much of the mind of like the meek will inherit the earth um and uh, in his mind that kind of led to his group in, uh, eventually being destroyed and his father being killed and so that first issue really looks at 
uh, even though this guy has kind of walked away from humanity, he doesn't think there's really any good left. He doesn't feel that, you know, you know, there's not really anyone left to guard as a guardian, so to speak. Um, but then he runs into this situation where in the end, he still has a little bit of a hope in humanity. Um, okay. Can't let that go. So, and so a, a hopeful, optimistic, but you know, very skilled. It's kind of like a Archer and Armstrong, but solo kind of thing. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's like every time that he has to use violence, he feels that it kind of, it takes a little bit away from him and a little bit of his humanity. Uh, and he, and he doesn't like to do it, but he, but the problem is he thinks that is just the world that he lives in. Sound like he could be a fan favorite. I'd like to like that premise of that. Uh, I know I said that last question was my last question, but I saw your books, the gateway books, and they're available on Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Um, how old are these books? Uh, I think 2014, 15, I was with a publisher originally. Um, I didn't realize that I could, uh, they were taking half of my money to do stuff that I could do. Um, <laughs> so that's usually how it goes, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then I started putting those out. There's, uh, let me see, there's Gateway, Saint, Uprising, and Schism. And the main series, there's also a prequel that follows uh, Captain Emily Martin. She's kind of one of the main characters. And it's her kind of uh, coming of age story. There's another uh, novella that's in the same universe that follows a secondary character. Um, and then I'm working on the fifth and final book in that um, series right now. Good God, man. you're always busy, aren't you? Yeah, right. The comic books have distracted me from the books for a few years. Of this, uh, The first comic I wrote was probably two and a half years ago. Really? Um, and I just really, really like it. And so I think in my mind when I'm writing, I'm, I'm in picturing like a movie playing out so in terms of like <laughs> we start like i'm writing a screenplay and then work my way back and and comics is that happy median ground for me where it doesn't cost me a hundred thousand dollars to get my story <laughs> <laughs> but it still costs me like three or four grand to do it yeah it's not cheap i know that yeah um well i guess i got one more question for you uh since i see all this since you told me about all your accolades like the film the book like all the events that you're going to be going to, hopefully by the end of, end of this year or the beginning of next. Um, if anyone wanted to submit a comic book to you, is that possible? Um, not yet. And the reason why it's the same thing, I've had some people kind of hit me up for publishing a book as well. And the truth is the only reason that I'm not is I, I don't feel like right now that I could do someone else justice as a publisher. Gotcha. Um, because we've really just looked at starting to do this as a business this last year and a half. Um, and so um, if I was going to publish someone, right, I would want if it, particularly if it was a book, I'd want to be able to give them an advance. I'd want to tell them that I've got, you know, this much money to put into marketing for them. I'll guarantee gotcha. them to get them in the cons and all this other stuff where um, right now I'm just kind of working on doing that for me. Um, and I feel if I, if I took, someone in for that i just wouldn't be doing them justice so you i'm not opposed to it in the long time. run but gotcha. i want to do the right thing by um because that, that's one of the things that i saw when i was with the publisher is you know where, where are you marketing me at are we going to be at this show we're going to be at this show you know and, and it just i just wasn't seeing it um and so they were literally were taking half the money to you know do editing and then send it in to Ingram for, for setup for distribution, which I can do that myself. So, so it's not, a, so it's just, it's not a no, just not a, not right now. That's what you're saying. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. When I feel that I'm comfortable and I'm doing it and I'm making a profit that is good and I can do the same thing for someone else. Um, I will definitely be open to that. I like the mentality, man. Right on. I think that's it. That's all I got for you. How, how are you doing otherwise? Uh, I'm doing okay. It's a, it's a, like I said, it's kind of an interesting time in the world. Um, you know, as a kind of upper middle class white male from West Virginia, I think there's probably some people that think that I lean one way when I definitely lean the other way. Gotcha. Um, and um, part of it, I think, is, uh, you know, where I grew up, I think if I would have stayed there and not opened my eyes to the world, uh, I could I, I could very much be a Trump supporter, and I have no idea how I could do that. Um, but uh, it's just a it's a crazy time, um, you know. I've you know, in terms of Facebook friending and unfriending, is kind of a 
uh, you know, it's yeah, kind of like a drop in a bucket of, right now of making a stand, but like I've unfriended like seven people that I know from West Virginia in the last week. Um, but I actually had a really, um, just right before I talked to you, I had a conversation with my son, he's active duty, um, in the Navy and, um, it's for, he's from my first marriage, uh, and my uh, first wife was black and Hispanic. And so, um, we just had a long conversation about like, you know, how does, how does he feel dealing with, you know, all these issues while being in the military, while we're hearing about what one person wants to do with the military and is getting pushed back from senior advisors and all that stuff. So it's, you know, it's a real thing for him, uh, both from, you know, the terms of, of growing up as a, as a person of color from kind of a mixed race marriage. And, um, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's tough. There's a lot to talk about and not all of it's really comfortable all the time. Yeah, it sounds like you got a lot more in your mind than you're, than you're telling me right now, man. That's wow. Yeah. Well, so you're, it's, you're going it's through tough. the motions too. Yeah. And it's tough. My, um, you know, my other son is trans. Uh, my, uh, niece is, um, uh, is, a, is a lesbian. And so like coming from West Virginia and like trying to have these conversations with family members about that stuff you know you can go so far then you're just like you're wrong and then that's kind of the, the discussion that's kind of it then but, yeah um, yeah um so yeah yeah hopefully all this brings about a better day uh you know uh, i was talking to my son about it and i feel that you know everyone was surprised you know i don't want to jabber on forever but um you're good i uh um you know, my, I've, my master's degree is in social science, so it looks at, like, history and, and political science and all these things about, like, why these movements take place and why these historical changes occur. Um, and I really looked, I had no, no idea that, like, Trump was going to win this election. I kept telling, like, like, my son, who was trans, who was physically afraid of him winning, um, that, like, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. There's no way that this guy can win, right? Um, yeah. And he won. And so I had to look back and be like, how did this happen? And, and I think the reality of it is um, there's a group of people, whether through pure hatred or complete ignorance. Um, and the reason I say that is going back to if I had not left where I grew up and right. had not seen other things, I would have been susceptible to being one of those people. Um, but those two groups for felt that with our first African-American president and him being uh, a liberal that like th things were moving too far the other direction and, and, and it was all based on fear. And so their fear of what they don't know, um, you know, most of the people that I know from West Virginia haven't met a trans person or haven't met, you know, uh, you know, just other, someone other, right? Um, and so it's all fear-based without a lot of truth to it. Um, and so they got swept up into this thing. Um, and then there's just the pure evil people too. Um, oh, and why are you going to get to that part? Like I, I can understand. Yeah, well, I don't hear the fear part very often, but I do just hear about like the rotten bad people all the time. Yeah. Uh, I honestly think in the long run, I'm trying to, and it's me trying to put a positive spin on this, that this, this presidency has allowed the bad apples to come up to the surface, oh, yeah. right? Because they think they've got a safe place, right? Um, and then that's where you get some of these politicians and you're like, how can you say this? There's no way this isn't racist, right? Um, but what happens when we get through this, right? That person is now uncovered, they're seen. They can't go back yeah. into the shadows, right? So hopefully this is identifying, you know, the last vestiges of this kind of thing. But I mean, there's a lot of issues with this it's um um i've got two friends that are cops and i've had some conversations with them about this uh, and both of those are actually what i consider like really morally strong people uh, and one of them actually told me a story that um at the first department they worked at um, he had to pull another officer off of someone that he was beating that was already handcuffed my goodness um, physically pulled him off of him and then wrote him up um, he ended up having to go to another department Wow! because of the, this, and I, and I made a Facebook post about this, this brotherhood of arms and then, you know, 
I was indoctrinated into it in the military as well, right? That this whole idea that like this person beside me, I've, I've got to have their back, so they're going to have mine. We have right. to, you know, but what has happened is, you know, there's been a qualifier added to that, that when it says, I've got this person's back, no matter what they do, instead of I've got this person's back, as long as they are acting in the best interests of, of the citizenry, right? Exactly. Uh, because they transitioned this loyalty to their group, which to some degree there has to be to do these type of things, but it's, it's lost its vision and that the whole reason for this need for unity for police officers, for military, when we talk about the SIL team atrocity that took place a few years ago, um, is like the core purpose for all these people who are serving is they're serving citizenry. Not, they're not serving the person next to you, right? So these, all these organizations have to find a way to at the same time have this esprit de corps, this, this, this trust for one another, but that also has to be a trust that if I get out of line, I'm going to get called on. Um, and, and that's what is lacking right now. Yeah. Yeah. And that has to happen. And um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the other friend of mine who's a cop, I talked to him and he was his, he, um, one, he was exhausted because he'd been working the, the protest for like the last 18 hours. Um, but he said he hates that when someone looks at him, they think about that, that, that cop that just killed someone or those four cops that just killed someone. Yeah. You know, he hates it because he wears a uniform that's supposed to mean serve and protect a certain percentage of the population looks at him in the same way. And he, and he said, he's like, I understand why they do that. He's like, and he actually, in the actual message we're having, he's like, we need to come to grips with the fact that I think his words are black people are getting fucked over all across the country. Yeah. Um, and so he's part, you know, we need more people like that in uniform. I agree. Uh, and less like that asshole, you know? Um, and to me, when we talk about pure evil, right? Uh, and I looked at this almost from like a systematic thing with these four officers is um, that guy is, he's a factory defect, right? Like, like that is, that is evil. Like I don't Pure. think society's going to fix that guy. No. Right. He's one of those the, rotten to the core people. The, the, the thing that really hit me because I just look at that guy and he's like, that's murder pure and simple uh similar to the way that a group will watch a drunk girl get raped those three policemen watch someone get murdered they're just as bad right and so they are the ones to assume that guy is evil and is always going to be evil they have to stop that they have to realize their duty is to that person that is on the ground and i had, I had a debate with someone about this and, you know, because they were the, this kind of uh, excuse kind of machine for stuff. And I was like, it doesn't matter what happened before that video. No. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, George Floyd could have done the most horrific thing that you could possibly think of one second before that video started. And it doesn't matter. Does not. Because once that person is on the ground, handcuffed as a law enforcement officer, the threat is gone. So that person shifts from a threat to a citizen, no matter what happened before that. And then it's up to like the actual law to take over from there, agreed. Yeah, and it's, you know, and, you know, I haven't been in that situation, but um, that's the expectation as someone who pays taxes and someone who is a citizen and someone who's a human being, if your job's hard, your job's hard. My job was hard in the Navy. I was still expected to do it the right way. Um, and that's, that's what it comes down so to. That's what we have to do. Right, that's why we have yeah. training. And, um, uh, you know, the other friend of mine told me, um, he, he said he would, he was almost involved in a, in a shooting. Um, and, he said it wasn't even a matter of seconds or milliseconds. It was a matter of how much pressure he had on the trigger. Um, and he would pulled over someone um, and they had, um, 
dropped their um, license in the floor. Okay. And they'd already pulled up the plate came back as um i forget what it was whether it was stolen or the plates didn't match or something so there was something that already had him you know more aware more tense um so he dropped his license and he leaned over and when he leaned over he said he said he stepped forward and looked into the car and there was a pistol on the floor um and so he drew his gun backed up he's yelling gun 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 and the guy raised up and he said for some reason i he didn't shoot, right? Um, he said everything slowed down, and he came up, and he saw white instead of black because he had his ID and not the gun, and he didn't shoot it, you know? And uh, he said he thought a lot about that, and like what was, because he could have shot that person, and it would have been a clean shoot, right? Um, in terms of how that would have been investigated, right? There's a gun on the floor, he knelt down, and he shot it, right? Um, and so I, I really like when I'm able to, he's a Portland cop, but uh, when I get a chance to talk with him, because he's, he's cerebral and he thinks about things and, um, you know, he, he worked in the nuclear program in the Navy with me. So um, he, um, we have some pretty interesting conversations when it comes to like law enforcement and how that, how that should be. He actually said that their most effective officers right now are female police officers because they talk to people. That's um, what a lot of protesters are doing. They're doing yeah, currently. So, they're talking to people. Yeah, they're much more focused on actually um, engaging with the public and talking to people as opposed to the old school idea that I have to show force to gain control of the situation. I get that. But, yeah, sorry, I've probably been babbling a little bit, but no, obviously you're everybody's good. thinking about this stuff a lot. <laughs> Hopefully everybody's thinking about this stuff a lot. Uh, uh, if they're following me, they absolutely are. Yeah, that's <laughs> mostly what I'm talking about right now, so. But uh, this has been great, Brian. Brian Dorsey of Mountaineer Western, I'm saying it wrong, Mountaineer <laughs> West Production. And yeah. When I get Mountaineer, I just think Western every single time. Yeah, yeah, and it, it came up with that because uh, West Virginia, the football teams, and the, and the people, it's Mountaineer is kind of the name, and then I'm living on the West Coast, so I just kind of kind of picked that. But. It works for the logo. The MW looks real nice. I dig it. It was easy for me to do, too. I did that myself, so I didn't need any artistic ability. <laughs> well, this has been a great episode. It's been nice talking with you, Brian. This is uh, Deed FTL Nerd Talk. You guys have a good one.